set the cutoff at 15%. So anything above 15% has been shown to, if you don't treat it, has been shown to reduce implantation, increase miscarriage, so decrease your live birth rate. And we found that if we treat those patients with a Zymo dish first, we get rid of the negative effect of DNA fragmentation. So we raise them to the same level as patients without DNA mm. fragmentation. And this is why we like to use it for those, yeah. Okay, mm. great. Yeah. So which, which techniques has it replaced? Maybe Anna first. Yeah, so um, we were doing, a, a, um, I guess, a modified density gradient centrifugation. You like modifying things, don't you? Yeah. Modif <laughs> modified density gradient means? I, I guess we were doing a 10-minute and a 5-minute wash. Okay, so a little bit shortened. Yeah, but obviously we were aware of the, um, the impact of the generation of the ROS, so we wanted to kind of minimise the... Um, impact so yeah so. okay so it, mm. part of it is the removal of centrifugation yes. for yes. most of the cases certainly for the ICSI cases we're doing, still doing a 5 minute um, 300G wash for our IVF cases yeah. okay. um, but certainly for our ICSI cases we're, we're no longer doing a, 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 any centrifugation at all, whatsoever okay. mm. uh, and similar in Hamburg you, you, you do a would normally have done a density gradient and you still do a wash for your conventional IVF cases? Yes, we do still do the wash step for the conventional IVF cases. Um, so it got rid of the density gradient centrifugation and in the lab it's also replaced the pixie dish for us because that's what we would usually recommend to patients who had an elevated DFI was the pixie dish. But I prefer the Zymo dish because it's just less handling time. So that's something it's also replaced. Okay, so let's, let's just explore that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you're potentially using the Zymot as a replacement for hyaluronin binding. Yeah. And we'll come to clinical impacts at the moment, but the, the Zymot's col collecting a population of sperm and the Pixie dish is, is identifying a single sperm, but your experience is that you get similar outcomes with both approaches? Yes, with the pixie dish, obviously you're trying to select the mature sperm, the ones that express the receptors on the, on the surface. But we found that with Zymot, those are the only sperm that come through the membrane. Mm. So I've heard from some people who like to do both, so they do Zymot and then pixie, oh. and find that pretty much 100% of sperm bind to the dish. So you may, may as well just get rid of the dish, because mm. that would be another 20 to 30 minutes handling time in the IVF lab that you can just get rid of because you have already <laughs> selected the most potent, the best sperm. Mm. Okay, yes. so which... You're targeting the sperm DNA fragmentation patients. Are there any other patients that you feel it benefits? Um, we feel that the patients who've gone through a very long fertility journey they like to opt for the Zymote dish, even if there's no clear indication for it, because they feel like they want to do something. The women do so much. They take supplements, they watch their diet, they exercise mm. carefully. And the men are just stood there and they can't really support, well, they try everything, obviously, <laughs> but sometimes they don't feel as, as included in the entire treatment mm. as are the women. Um, so this is something for the men to say, come on, this is something I can do, something I can help with to provide the best sample. So that's usually why some people opt for the Zymo dish as well. Okay. And you're using it almost exclusively for your Yeah, cases. so for all suitable samples, it's, it's routine. It's routine. Um, and I guess we're, we're in the process of um, gathering cumulative pregnancy rate data because mm. then maybe it will answer your question more scientifically, like who which um, subgroup populations actually do find the most benefit. And, and you've mentioned, um, you've mentioned the, the uh, for instance, the viral discordant couples that you wouldn't use it for. Are there any other patients you don't use it for? Uh, I I've have, have heard that other labs are using it for like teaser samples. <laughs> we're not, not um, game enough to do that just yet. So probably just the, um, the severe oligos and the teasers and the, even some of 
initially we weren't using it on the highly viscous samples, but now we've kind of like I dilute them with some media, mm. break them down a bit, and they seem to mm. be working okay, mm. unless they're like extremely viscous. And do you have a lower threshold for when you use Zymot? Because we, um, yes. we typically say a total mot motile count of one million, but I, I know it varies from user to user. You're yeah, both laughing at ours me, is that. Uh, uh, 0 0.5. 0.5. Yeah. Can, oh, ours is as soon as we see motile sperm, we use it. So use any motile sperm, any you will try and put it yeah. through a zymot. We find that when we use the raw sample, and I mean, we take six microliters of the raw sample to get an initial mm. uh, idea of what the sample is like. And if we see one motile sperm in six microliters, we then like to opt for the three milliliter dish, use the entire sample that the man provided us with, and see what we come up with. Because worst case scenario is that we have to ask the man to come back to provide a second sample. But that's easily done. Does that happen very often? It doesn't happen very no, often. No, no. no. That, that, that's really interesting that you use the larger device for the mm -hmm. poorer samples to try and get mm -hmm. the yield. Yeah. And if you, if you then harvest from the three mil, it's in a larger volume, do you then concentrate that down? Yeah. Yeah. So, you, so you've got a centrifugation step, a little a bit very like small the, one, yeah. the conventional IVF yeah. cases, yeah. but it, you feel that's, that's yeah. worthwhile. What about IUIs, where you've got potentially a normal zoospermic, would you use a three mil device, the 850, you're, you're not... We don't use thymoid for the IUI, because we feel that, um, first of all, we don't do a lot of IUIs in our clinic mm. anyway, because most of the patients that come to us have already had a number of treatments elsewhere, mm. so they will have already tried the IUI route. Mm. Um, but if we do IUI, we say, well, we'd only recommend it for those patients without elevated DNA anyway, um, so DNA fragmentation. And I do think that the uterus and the fallopian tubes, they also have a sort of filter function. Yeah. yeah. What, what about you, Emma? Yeah, is, is we, I... we do use it for all of our IUIs. I guess um, it's probably more of a um, best practice and just um, lab convenience and efficiency. Um, it works really well. And would you use the three mil device for IUI or yes. do you sometimes? Yes. Oh. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, it, I guess it depends on the volume of the sample, but probably more so the three mil. And again, if you're doing um, IUI and you use the three mil device and you, you're taking off more than a mil, I think, isn't it? Yeah, um, do you then spin it down to concentrate so you're inseminating similar, with yeah. 0 0.3, 0 0.5 yeah, mil? Similar yeah. to like an IVF prep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we've, we've talked a little bit about um, sperm DNA fragmentation, the efficiency gains. What do you see in terms of the impact on patient outcomes? Maybe Emma first. Um, well, with to be honest, we're still collating all of the data. We certainly have seen um, no significant difference in um, failed FERTs, which is obviously something that we were monitoring. We've seen a, a significant increase in our IVF um, fertilisations. And um, I guess ultimately, with any of these new technologies, we want to see, does it make more babies? So that's what we ultimately are gathering all the cumulative um, pregnancy data for, so that hopefully we can see that. Yeah. And, and Kimberly, I know you've been using it for a long time and I've mm -hmm. seen some of your data. Maybe yes. you could comment. Yeah, so because we use it for the patients who have a poorer prognosis than the ones without DNA fragmentation, we see that we can raise them to the same level as the ones that don't have a, so as the ones that have a good prognosis. So we have seen an increase in embryo utilization rate an increase in pregnancy rate, a reduction in miscarriage rate, which ultimately leads mm. to an increase in life birth rate. And the, especially the increase in embryo utilization means that when they then come back for the second child, we still have an embryo frozen. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Maybe we could go to see if anyone in the audience has any mm. questions while our experts are here. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask Emma or Kimberly or indeed both? Are there any questions? Yeah. You're all convinced. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> okay. 
in that case, what we'll do, thank you, Emma, thank you, Kimberly. Thank, thank you. you. Fantastic insight into the real use rather than just um, people who uh, deal with them on a day to day basis. It's good to get the practical experience. What we'll do now is I'm going to hand over to Nick Campion, who is the real um, Cooper Surgical Expert on, um, on Zymot, and he's going to do, do a practical demonstration. So I think we'll have a couple of minutes while we switch over. Uh, please hang around and you can see how it's actually used, and Nick will show you that. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you.